Brother Yates reminded me that tomorrow night is the first of three debates between the Republican presidential nominee, Donald Trump, and the Democrat presidential nominee, Hillary Clinton. And it's my understanding there will be three of them tomorrow night at Hofstra, I think it's Hofstra uh, University in New York. They say that upwards of a hundred million people will watch this debate tomorrow night. I'm going to say, as I've heard so many others say, this is probably the most important election that this nation will ever, ever, ever go through. And what happens November the 8th is going to determine the future of this country. And if you put the wrong person in office, then you're going to get more of the same. And the same has been that we are on a downward spiral. They're taking our children away from us. The transgender movement and the sodomite movement is moving apace, and nothing is slowing it down. And this is the, this is the legacy of Barack Obama, the Democrat, and you know good and well what Hillary's going to do when she goes in there. You might say tonight, well, I don't like Trump. There's a lot of things about Trump I don't like either. But I want to tell you something right now. He is vastly better than Hillary Clinton when it comes to be the president of this country. That's all I can say. So... Do some serious praying about it, and the debate tomorrow night they say is crucial because uh, because uh, of of the uh, it's about a third, one third. That's a big number. A third of the voting, uh, the potential voting pool, ha is undecided, and so they're going to be watching this. A third obviously can swing the election one way or the other, and if uh, and if uh, if Trump wins the the uh, debate that he may very well swing toward his side and, uh, and may very well go in as the next president of the United States. The Republicans aren't going to save you. The politics aren't going to save you. But as a citizen of this country, you've got a responsibility to do the right thing. For him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And so I'm not going to preach to you and wear it out and beat you to death over the head with it all the time, but you know how I feel and where, I've, where I stand and what I've said. And early voting will start probably sometime in October. And if you've never voted before, I recommend early voting because you won't have to stand in line near as long. I always try to go to early voting, get in and out a lot quicker, unless you just like to stand in long lines. Now, some folks like that. And, uh, and if, that's, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. Turn with me in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 tonight. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. I saw that the other day. He's a professor at uh, some, some university here in the States, and uh, he is saying that Trump is going to win. Second Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 16. The Apostle Paul says, I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak, is not, it, speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For you suffer fools gladly, seeing, you suffer your, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool now, he said. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in death soft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I spent in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, 
in weariness and painfulness and watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside these things that uh, are without that which cometh upon me daily the care of all the churches, who is weak, and I am not weak, who is offended, and I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you bless your holy word tonight. In thy holy name we pray. Amen. What you have here is the Apostle Paul gives you a litany of the many things that he had endured for the preaching of the cross of Christ. It is what he had by himself experienced firsthand. He had experiential knowledge of what the ministry was all about. For the ministry for the Apostle Paul was a ministry at times, which was certainly at times uh, his life was in jeopardy. And, uh, and he suffered it. He suffered it all. Uh, therefore, if you could have gone to the Apostle Paul toward the end of his life, he would have, has said, he would have said this to you. I have finished my course. And finishing his course meant that he did what God called him to do. He went where God sent him. And he, and, and he, and he uh, finished the ministry that God put him, in to do, to put him to do. That's what all any of us can do tonight. And so I want to title this message tonight, uh, Where You Will Find Yourself in the Ministry. And where do you find yourself right now as you walk with the Lord? I remember a few years ago that I went to Paul Mall, Tennessee. That's a little community up there. It's not far from Jamestown. And I went specifically to see the, home, the homestead of Sergeant Alvin C. York. Alvin York is one of my heroes. He was a, uh, he was a, uh, com- he was a combatant in World War I. He was a descendant of what's called the Long, uh, the Long Hunters, I think is the name. In other words, he came from a long line of men who were, who were expert, gifted in the use of firearms. And he was a conscientious objector, did not want to go to the war, but uh, they reasoned with him and told him that if he'd come, that the fact that he was there and could use that weapon so well that he could save lives. He decided to go. And he went into World War I with that Alt-3, I think it was, 30 Alt-6 Springfield, the 30 out six is one outstanding round to this very day, one of the best. And when he got on the battlefield, our Sergeant Alvin C. York proved himself to be not only courageous, but smart. He was able to look at a battlefield and see what needed to be done to, uh, to, to advance the cause of his company or his battalion or what he was with. And so he wiped out essentially a whole German uh, machine gun nest. And then he took a bunch of them captive. And because of his exploits on the battlefield, Sergeant York was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. And when he came back to the state of Tennessee, Tennessee showed him how much they appreciated his service by giving him a piece of land and a house. That was a wonderful thing to show this man what they thought of him. Sergeant York could have made a lot of money because of his uh, celebrity. He was a Medal of Honor winner. He was a very good, decent man. But he chose to stay right there in his hometown and to build an institute. He called it the York Institute. And that was to teach young men and women a trade, some kind of an education, to help them. Because back then, it was an area that was so far removed from a good education. And he wanted to do something to change it. For his people. And because he had this celebrity and so well known in the government, he was able to do it. He built the institute. And I remember seeing that when I went to Jamestown. I preached revival there one time, a few years ago. And I would drive by that institute each night as I went to the church to preach. And I thought back about what this man did and how he had a, such a magnanimous heart and how he loved people and he wanted to help people. But I learned something when I got to his home that I didn't expect. I got to the home of Sergeant York, and they took us on a tour. His son, I think it was, his son led the tour through the house. 
And there was an old family Bible. There was a bookcase. And I broke my neck to see what books he had in there. <laughs> and, uh, and they took us through there. And then they took us to a bed next to a window. And they said, now, Sergeant York had a stroke. And for ten years, ten years, he lay in that bed right there. Ten years. This big, strong, strapping, courageous warrior from World War I, conscientious objector who did not want to go fight, and yet he went to fight. Honorable man, as honorable as they come. He wound up spending the last ten years of his life in a bed because of a stroke. Now, I'm not going to judge God. I mean, you shouldn't judge God. We don't judge God and things like this. That's the Almighty. He makes these calls and these choices. And I don't know what he ministered from that bed, and I don't know how many people he touched. I have no idea of the effect that that had on people. No doubt the fact that he was a warrior affected a lot of young men. I'm sure a lot of young men go into the army and, and the military thinking about Sergeant York, and they would like to be like him, no question. And, but I wonder how his life, ten years in a bed next to that window, I wonder how that affects people. It affected me. When I learned of that, I thought this man was not only courageous on the battlefield, he was courageous here because it took something to live like that. It took something. It took something for him not to, to blow his brains out, to commit suicide, as so many veterans do. They're dying every day in this country. The veterans come back to a country that for a lot of people, for the most part, uh, are not a, the least bit appreciative. The, the, the VA is a joke in a lot of places when it comes to taking care of our veterans. If this country ought to take care of anybody, it ought to take care of its veterans. Amen. 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 But so far, all this has been is a bunch of talk, and they haven't done anything for our veterans. They ought to take care of them. But, but uh, you know, a lot of them are committing suicide. They come back and they, they have this called post-traumatic stress syndrome, this uh, coming back from the battlefield, and, and, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and some of them are shell-shocked. And for whatever other reasons, it, it just it takes some of them, it have a, they have a hard time fitting back into the society. And you know something, folks, don't judge them. Because when you've been on the battlefield and you've watched your, 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 your friends with their head blown off or a leg blown off or, or their intestines falling out in front of you and, and you see all this kind of carnage, you, you'll never be the same again. And the battlefield is not, uh, you know, it's not Knoxville. The battlefield's the battlefield. And it does something to you. But it does encourage me to know that Sergeant York's faith in Christ was strong enough to get him through ten years in that bed. Ten years. And so while I was there, I got a cup. There's a, across the street, there's a, there's, a, there's a mill over there, and there's a store. And they used to, they used to run a mill, and they had a store. And, uh, and the York family did all of that and took care of all of that. And I think right next to his house, there, when I went not too long ago, there's still a, some kind of a country store there. And still there, and uh, I bought a coffee cup. And I make sure that I drink coffee out of that coffee cup because that's my Sergeant York cup. Amen. Now, you may be drinking out of a Mickey Mouse cup, okay. But mine's Sergeant York. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I drink coffee out of my Sergeant York cup because it reminds me I was there, and I respect and honor that man, and I honor his testimony. And I want you to know that sometimes the road can get hard. Sometimes it can get where you can't, uh, you can't make sense of it. But what you've got to do is to put your trust in God and put your life in the hands of the Lord and say, Now, Lord, here I am. If you're not going to change the circumstances I'm in, give me the grace of God to minister from where I am. Because make no mistake about it, there's another Christian out there right now. There's a real believer in Christ lying flat on their back from a stroke or a heart attack or something, and they need encouragement and they need the grace of God. They need to know that they're not the only ones who've gone through something like that. And so you never know where you're going to find yourself. I'll give you a few illustrations from the Bible and then come to a close. But I want to mention just a few in the Scripture. One is Lodibar. And the word Lodibar literally means in Hebrew, the lo in Hebrew negates the word. Like the word lo ami, it means not my people. Well, lo debar means not the word. Debar is word in Hebrew. And so what it means to me it is that here we have Mephibosheth, who by no fault of his own is dropped when he was a child, and therefore he is a, he's an invalid from the, for the rest of his life, and no doubt he could have become very bitter, and he could have become, I mean, no doubt 
Satan worked on him. And he certainly felt that uh, much of that because when he was invited to the king's table to sit down, and David was a gracious man, he said, Is there any of the house of Saul that I might show that I might show grace and mercy for Jonathan's sake? Because he loved Jonathan. And they said, Well, there's only one we know is Mephibosheth. And they called him and he said, Bring him in. And they brought him to the table. And here's what Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth said. He said, Who am I, a dog? <laughs> I mean, I'm a dog that you brought me to sit at the king's table. Now, that's genuine. That's humility. Humility will get you a long way with God. <laughs> a smart aleck tongue, an arrogant know-it-all attitude, he'll slam the door in your face. But if you ever have real humility, he'll open doors for you. And he opened that one for Mephibosheth. What a dog, he said. Do you know what Paul said in 1 Timothy about himself when God called him? He said, he said I am a pattern for them that should hereafter believe on him. That's what Paul said. He said, I'm a pattern. He said, the way that I got saved is the way God saved. He saves dirty, rotten, low-down sinners. And he said, I was injurious. That's what Paul said. I inflicted injury on people. He said, I received mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So Paul, every chance he had, he let people know, I'm no good. There's nothing good about me. I came up out of hell, and he reached down and took hold of me, and he saved me. The apostle was humble, and so was Mephibosheth, and so was Sergeant York, because of humility allowed him to stay in that bed and put up with that life. Ten years, folks. Now ask yourself, I could ask myself this question, could I do that? Could I live like that? I'd have to say, Lord, you'd have to give me grace. I'd have to, what's grace, preacher? Grace is strength that you don't deserve. Grace is when God ministers something to you that you've got to have to deal with that circumstance and live through it and witness and testify for the grace of God. So it is. You may find yourself like that. I hope not. I hope not. I hope not. It's not. Aren't you glad that it's not the call of a man to choose what happens to us in this world? That's God's call. That's the sovereign, eternal God. That's His call. That's not my call. I'm not the judge. It's not for me to stand up and say, you need to spend so much time here. You need to be locked up over there. You need this and you need that. No, we all need. Amen. We all need. We are all in great need. Amen. There's the juniper tree. How many of you are under the juniper tree? So what's that, preacher? Well, Elijah, the great Elijah, went to the top of Carmel and he laughed at the prophets of Baal. He said, you go ahead, you go first. You go first. Go ahead. Here it is. <laughs> Just do your thing. And they cut themselves and jumped up and down and screamed, the Bible said, after their manner. And they went through all kinds of rituals and everything and this and that and so forth and so on. And Elijah just stood over there in the corner like this, patted his foot. Go ahead, boys. It's yours. Do your thing. Go right ahead. <laughs> and they couldn't do anything because they're God. And you know what Elijah said? Say, where is he? <laughs> you suppose he's out somewhere doing something? <laughs> what happened to him? Oh, he mocked them. He mocked them. And then when they were finished, you know the story. You know the story. The God that answers by fire, let him be God. And of course, God did answer by fire, but he wanted to make sure they understood that it was a supernatural fire. They soaked that sacrifice. They soaked that altar. And then fire came down from heaven. As it does in the Old Testament, every time God puts His approval on a sacrifice, the way we know that Abel's sacrifice was accepted and Cain was rejected is because God sent fire down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. The fire that was on the brazen altar where they offered the sacrifice unto God, that fire was not a man-made fire. If it had been a man-made fire, it was a strange fire. And Nadab and Abihu paid the price for a strange fire. It was a fire that came down from God. Fire cleanses, fire purges, fire from God. The fire that comes down to the sacrifice, His fire will fall on you. And it can cleanse you, it can purge you, and prepare you for the ministry of God. And Eliyah, Eliyah, Jehovah, his name literally means Elohim is Jehovah. In other words, Elohim is God. Elohim is God. The idea was Elijah, the Tishbite, showed up from nowhere. He stood toe-to-toe, eyeball-to-eyeball, one man. 
against the 450 prophets of Baal. He stood eyeball to eyeball, called the fire of God down from heaven. God ordained his man. He anointed his man. He showed him that was his man. There was no doubt in anybody's mind that Elijah was the man of God. But he ran from Jezebel. <laughs> you see how God uses his servants? If you ever get so enamored with a man that you think that man is perfect, then you're in the wrong place. Men are just men. And that the best man at best is just a man. That's right, folks. No, no minister going to have good they are and how much respect I have for them. And there's some men that I have great respect for. Believe me, I do. But they are just men. They're capable of error. And so Elijah, when he found out Jezebel was after him, took off, sat down under a juniper tree and said, I'm no better than my father's. Just let me go on here. I'm finished. He started feeling sorry for himself, licking his wounds. You ever get in to have a good pity party? How many ever had a good pity party? Everybody raise your hand. You have a good pity party. Somebody said something, stuck their tongue out at you. Somebody did something to you, this and that, and you start feeling sorry for yourself, having a good pity party. What did it ever produce in your life? Nothing good. Nothing's ever good come of it. Nothing good. Nothing good. God said, Elijah, get up from there. Get up from there. Get up from there. He said, Arise. And you know what he did? He'd already called his replacement. Elisha was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen. He told him who to go anoint in his stead. He told him what king was going to be anointed. And then he sent him to the mountain of God. And he went forty days to the mountain of God. He got in the mountain of God, the same place Moses went to when he got the tables of the law. Probably the same place that Paul went to when he went off into Arabia to receive the New Testament. The manifestation of the, of the, of the mysteries of God. The biggest portion of the New Testament that was written. Probably the same place. And there God began to deal with Elijah. Hallelujah. And I still have the greatest respect for Elijah. Amen. Just because I know his weaknesses and I know his failures, that doesn't stop me from loving him and respecting him. Elijah is a prophet of God, folks. On the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, two figures showed up from hundreds of years before. Two of them. Two of them. The first one was called from a burning bush. And then we have the Tishbite that showed up. Elijah and Moses talked with the Lord Jesus Christ about his exodus. That's the word that's used there. Exodus. Death is never an issue when the prince of life is involved. He's simply departing. The Apostle Paul said to depart and be with Christ, which is far greater. Amen. And so they talked about his exodus. I'd like to know what they talked about, wouldn't you? Amen. That'd be something. Just get over there to the side. <laughs> what are you all talking about over here? Amen. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Yes, sir. Bible doesn't record, but it'd be very interesting to see what they talked about. Have you know the story of Jonah? The story of Jonah? He had a gourd grow up over the top of his head. Now Elijah sits under a juniper tree, and Jonah sits down under a gourd. And he sat down under that gourd, and he began to pout. Now I know you've never pouted, but I have. Boy, I bawled and squalled, carried on, didn't get a bit of sympathy from my wife. <laughs> I can whine and carry on. She'll say, get out of here. <laughs> She'll say to me, you the pastor of that church will shut up. <laughs> so whining doesn't get me anywhere. <laughs> How many of you have ever whined around like that? <laughs> Where'd it get you? <laughs> well, he sat down under the gourd and he began to whine, you know. He said, Lord, I knew you. I know what you're going to do. I know you. And that's why I took off to Tarshish. He said, I know. I know these are the enemies of Israel. This is, this is Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. This is like going to Baghdad. This is like going to Moscow. This is like going to, to Tehran. This is the enemy of Israel. This is their capital. And Jonah said, now Lord, I, you, know, you know everything, but you've messed up this time. These people are our enemies. God said, you go over there and preach to them. You say to them, 40 days and God's going to destroy this place. Don't you ask me why I'm sending you. It's not up for you to know. You just go do what I say to do. You know what a Jonah did? He got him a ticket for where? He took off the opposite direction. He sure did. Well, he went through the whole thing. He spent that time in the whale's belly, real whale. 
A real whale, folks. Real whale. And, he, and the whale belched him up after three days. Three days. He was down there with the bars of hell around him and the seaweed wrapped around him. And, when that, when, and, and three days later, when that, when that, when that, uh, when that uh, whale belched him up, he came up from there just as white as a sheet. He had all of that digestive juice hanging on him and falling off of him. He'd been down there. Can you imagine what he looked like? He came up walking out of that whale's belly and here he's, his feet come up on the land. And the first person that sees him, they think they've seen a ghost. And the first thing that Jonah says is, repent. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. And he went to Nineveh. And it took him days to walk from one end to the other because it was such a great city. Huge city. And he went in there and he started preaching. And you know what happened? The king called a fast, put on sackcloth, and the people of Nineveh got right. These pagan enemies of Israel got right at the preaching of the Word of God. That means that Muslims can get right. That means that Russians can get right. That means that Americans can get right. That means Italians can get right. That means anybody can get right. The Word of God is for all men. Hallelujah to God for that. For all men. Amen. Not just a pick hand-picked bunch of uh, uh, elect, elected, but every man. But then his old human nature came back and God gave him a little comfort and let a gourd grow up over the top of his head. Grew up overnight too, as a matter of fact. Here this gourd comes up and, and shades him from the sun. And Elijah, uh, I mean Jonah enjoys the gourd. And then the gourd withers away. And God's going to show him a lesson. He's going to say, now look here. You're so upset over this gourd that was here here today and gone tomorrow. I brought it up and now it's gone. What's that gourd? I can bring a thousand gourds. I can, I can create anything like that. But he said, I've got millions of souls over there that don't know their right hand from their left hand. And that's what I called you for is to preach to them. Get your priorities right. And that's what happened. Have you got your priorities right tonight? Does it matter to you that one soul is worth more than every dog on the face of the earth? Amen. One little baby, whether it be from Haiti or whether it be from New York City, Amen. one little baby is worth more than all the animals on the face of the earth. Amen. If you don't see it that way, you've got your priorities wrong. Right. Because that baby is made in the image of God. Amen. Amen. Amen made in the image of God. Then we have this question I'll ask you tonight. Where are you? God said, Adam, where art thou? Where were you at this time last year? Where were you six months ago? Where are you spiritually with God tonight? Did that preaching stir you this morning? It stirred me. Did that testimony... You're conf- here's the thing. You're confronted with something now here today. That, that is undeniable. You have been confronted with a genuine, bona fide miracle. <laughs> miracle. This lady sent me an email the other day. I said something about speaking in tongues. And here's the problem with people. They'll grab onto what you say, get part of it, and then they'll put you in a classification. In other words, it works like this. Well, if you believe this, then you believe this, then you believe this, then you believe that. So you got it all figured out. You got me wrong. <laughs> I don't fit. You see, this lady said, I witnessed to a woman, or a man, I forget what case was, and she said, it was, I remember it now, I remember now. She said, this lady was in a nursing home. Nobody could communicate with this lady in this nursing home, is what she said. Nobody. Nobody. She said, I went up to that lady, and I began to pray with her. And then she said, something began to move and stir inside of me. And I started talking to that lady in pure Polish. And that lady literally lost it. Because somebody now could communicate with her in her own language. Now, do you believe that? I believe that. You haven't read the Bible where it says, forbid not to speak in tongues. See? See, my good Baptist brethren, they're getting fidgety now. You mean the preacher believes in speaking in tongues? This is a language. Polish. This is a bona fide miracle. There is no way in the world that this woman who doesn't know a word, I don't know a word of Polish, doesn't know a word of Polish, yet she begins to speak to this woman 
in her native tongue and witnesses the great mercy and grace of God. Then it happened again to her. I forget the circumstances. It's been a while since I read that email. You remember Miss Moreland? Did you read it? Well, anyway, it happened again. This time she was in a different set of circumstances. She was talking to somebody. And it wasn't Polish this time. It was an entirely different language. I wish I could remember what it was. I think it was Portuguese, but I'm not sure. But anyway, she talked to that woman in, in, their, in her native tongue. And it was a, absolutely no way did she know any of that. Yet she witnessed the great grace of God to her. Now, haven't you ever heard of Kurt Koch? Most haven't. He was a German theologian. He lived in the early 1900s. K-O-C-H. K-U-R-T-K-O-C-H. You ought to read what that man says about his trips around the world, about his confrontation with demons, and all kinds of stuff. But here's one of the things he said. He said, oh yeah, there's all kinds of counterfeit tongues out there. There's every kind of a wild, crazy thing. You, you can't... It's unbelievable. But he said, I have witnessed cases where a pure language was spoken to someone by someone who had no knowledge of that language whatsoever. And it witnessed to the grace of God and the salvation of souls. And God was glorified. So let me give give you this warning tonight. Let me give you this warning. I don't speak in tongues. I don't speak in tongues in a prayer language. I don't speak in tongues. But I am not going to stand up and tell someone if God is working a miracle and communicating with them by tongues to someone else. I'm not about to interject myself into it. I'll leave it alone. For the Bible says plainly, forbid not to speak in tongues. Biggest problem is this. You have seen so much abuse. So much, haven't you? Sure, you have, and it makes people. Tr- it makes people. Uh, what's the term for it? Uh, you just shy or, or afraid. They just they just want to back away from it. But remember this: these tongues are a sign, and there's a reason for it. And when you have a bona fide miracle like this, you got to deal with it. So I hope that you deal with the issue of this preacher that was here with us this morning, physician, doctor. Says he's got two clinics. He's run to death between the two of them. He's got a lot of nurse practitioners working for him. He's got all he can handle. But do you know where his burden is? His burden's not in doctrine. His burden is preaching the Word of God. <laughs> That's what he wants to be doing. Preaching God's Word. Like he did this morning. God healed that man. And there is no denying that is a miracle. I would like for some of these atheists to deal with that issue, wouldn't you? I would. They would run as fast as they could run to get away from a man like that because they can't deal with what happened to him. God healed him. It was an incurable disease. So where are you? Then there's the story. I've got two more and I'll come to a close tonight. Jeremiah chapter number 18, the Lord took Jeremiah down to the potter's house. The potter's house one of the greatest lessons in all the Bible. It really was. I, had to, I, have, I've, I, I, find, I, I went to the Holy Land six times, I think, if I can remember anything. But I remember this. I remember Hebron. Hebron is loaded with grapes. The hills, rolling hills. Mile after mile after mile of grapes. You remember when they sent the spies into Hebron and they came back with one cluster of grapes, took two men to carry them? Well, thousands of years ago, they grew grapes in Hebron. They still do. All right. But they do something else there. They have potters. And we were able to go into a little, just a little kind of a store on the side of the road. And we gathered around and we watched this man as he put his hands in the water and spun that wheel. And it just kept coming to my mind, the potter. The Lord is the potter and we're the clay. And I watched him as he formed it. He didn't put too much pressure. If you do, it falls apart. You have to know how to apply pressure, 
when to apply pressure, what direction to apply pressure, how much water to keep on your hands. All of this, it comes by time, skill. It's a learned skill. Pottery. And around him, you can see pieces of pottery that have been broken, didn't make it, you know, and, this, and that's all part of it. That's what happens to God's people sometimes. He puts you on the wheel. Your ministry's flying away. I mean, you're on the mountaintop. Everybody think, you think you're the greatest thing in the world. How in the world did Christianity get along before you showed up? And I mean, you're it, and you're moving on, and here you go. And then something happens, and a lot of time out of your control. And you wind up broken on the bottom. And some never recover. They cannot recover from a fall like that. But do you know what that potter did? That potter took that same vessel that was marred in his hands. Marred. Marred in his hands. And he made it again into another vessel. Remember, he is still the potter. And he makes it again into another vessel. Remember what I said the other day? The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. I preached that message, I think it was last Wednesday night. And then I met with a dear brother right after that. That had been greatly moved by the message that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Does that not go along with the pottery that's marred and he makes it again? He makes it again. He doesn't throw it aside. He doesn't kick it away. He makes it again. So you might have started out fast. And things might have come hard against you. Maybe it's taught a Sunday school class. Maybe anything in the ministry. Anything you try to do for the Lord. And it just blew up in front of you. And you're ready to quit now. Throw your hands up. Don't do that. What He'll do is teach you through that the lessons you need to learn to be able to minister to people who are going through the same thing you're going through. You remember what he said to you this morning? He ministered to me. He said, All right, Lord, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Okay. Remember when he said that? He said, Okay, this is it, this is it. He got up, stood up, raised his head up, said, Okay. I'm not going to shiver and shake. I'm not going to quake like a coward. If my time's come, I'm gone. That was his attitude. That attitude determined everything he did from that day forward. And that's what I did one day. My heart was so weak that I was so close to death. Ejection fraction of 19. Weak, weak, weak. And I thought, if I ever exert myself again, (laughs) my heart will just quit. Because there's no way that I can do anything. I'm done for. And then one day I said, Lord, done for or not, you've called me to preach. And I'm going to get up on that pulpit and if I drop where I'm standing, that's okay. Because I'm going to do what you call me to do. And I told you all when I did that. I am not going to quiver and shake and crawl under a rock somewhere and wait to die. I'm going to do what God called me to do. And you know what? You know what? When I started doing that and took that attitude, my heart started getting stronger. (laughs) It did. Now, I'm not running any marathons. Don't worry about that. Forget that business. But I'm not lying flat on my back. So weak, I can't do anything. If you don't think I can do anything, go ask my wife. She's got a honey-do list like you wouldn't believe. (laughs) Where's me? I mean, I had a little pity from her for a while. But when I was so weak, you know, I could see a little pity in her face. I could whine around a little bit and wouldn't have to do anything. Now, she expects as much out of me as she did before. (laughs) You guys, any of you guys married to somebody like that? (laughs) You are too, brother, huh? Okay. (laughs) Yes, sir. You know why? Because she knows I can do more. You know something? I'm glad I can do more. And the last one is this. Grinding in the prison. Samson. Boy, he's a hard one to figure. But you know something about Samson? Let's look over here in Hebrews chapter 11. 
This is the Hall of Fame, see, folks. Isn't he over here somewhere? I believe he is. Where's he at here now? 32? There he is. He's next to Jephthah. Hebrews 11, 32. And what, I sh what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, and Samson. He's in the Hall of Fame. And look who's listed with him. David, Samuel, and the prophets. That's a good bunch to be with. David is the only king Israel ever had that the kingdom was promised through David, his sons. All right. Samuel was the prophet of prophets. Amen. And so, Samson. How did he die? Suicide. You know anybody that said, you commit suicide, you're going to hell. Well, how would Samson get in here? Now, I'm not telling you to go out here and blow your brains out. <laughs> I'm not telling you to do that. I am telling you, though, that life can slip you some heavy-duty stuff. You think you're ready and you're not ready. I hope it never happens to me. I've had some preacher brethren. I know of three or four down through the years. I've been to their funerals, preached one, who took a weapon and took their life. Finished it here on this earth. Did they go to hell, preacher? Well, how did Samson get into heaven? That's suicide, folks. He pulled the temple of Dagon down on his head. The reason I chose him for last is because that is the last. Don't ever come to that point to where you're hopeless and you don't think God will ever do anything with you and you have no reason for living. There is a reason for living. We've all got a reason for being here. Every one of us. We've got a reason for being here. Because you know, our brother said this morning, he, uh, when we were eating, he said his wife's father pastored the church that they go to for 50 years. 50 years. Pastored there for 50 years. He said he was a bootlegger. <laughs> you say, was a bootlegger in pastoring? No. <laughs> no, he was a bootlegger when he got saved. Moonshine, moonshine, bootlegging, you know, all that. Then he got saved. And he pastored for 50 years. 50 years, 50 years. And he would tell them all the time, he would say, I am alive and I am here because God saved me and put me here and I'm living where He wants me to live and doing what He wants me to do. Amen. Now, that's that part that says, make your calling and election sure. See? I tell you all the time, I'm doing what God's called me to do. I'm where God has put me. I'm teaching and preaching, and I am sure of that. So I go home and I sleep. I'm not, I don't have, to, don't have to fight with it. Some of you are good people, and you love the Lord. And some of you preachers, you're good people. You love the Lord. You, love, you want to serve the Lord. You know you're called to preach, but you're not sure where you're supposed to be. You're not sure what you're supposed to be doing. That comes from God. Now, I'd say this. The church I got saved into couldn't teach me much. That's sad to say that, but they couldn't. You couldn't learn much. Wasn't much to learn. Wasn't much, to, wasn't much you could learn. There was a lot of dissension among the people. Some believed this, some believed that. Some were premillennial, some no millennial, all millennial. All kinds of problems. And I kind of wandered around. I wandered around looking for something. Just looking, looking. I went off to the Pentecostal churches looking for something. Went here, there, went everywhere looking for something. Didn't even know what I was looking for. But I knew I was called to preach. I knew that was right. When he doubt about it, I knew I was called to preach, but I was looking for something. And then I had a commentary laid into my hands by the least likely uh, means. And when I opened that commentary, the world, whole new world opened up for me. Because I found a man that could teach me something. And boy, did he ever. 
I started buying his commentaries and reading his commentaries. And right now I've got a pile of them. And he took me into the scripture and he taught me something. I immediately began to get my sail right, my anchor right, my direction right. It's not that he was trying to direct me. He was just teaching me the Bible. And I didn't know the Bible. When I first got saved, I didn't know anything. And I learned and I learned and I learned. And that's what I would recommend to any young man, especially the young men that are preachers. Learn as much as you can learn. Get yourself rooted and grounded in the Word of God before you try to go out and start pastoring and ministering to other people. It's a huge mistake to be saved into a church and not be saved that long and then jump up and take off and try to go out and pastor people because you're not ready for it. You're not prepared. You need that foundation. You need that you need it you need to be you need to be rooted in that foundation and you need a good working knowledge of what you're talking about in the scripture. If you don't get that, you'll pay a dear price for it. That man just died, he's gone on. His name's Peter S. Ruckman. Now when I say the name Peter Ruckman, a lot of people think, Good night, man. You're a Ruckmanite. No, I'm not a Ruckmanite. Peter Ruckman says a lot of things that I don't agree with. You don't know me. <laughs> you see what I mean? Amen. If you believe this, you believe that. You No, 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 you don't know me. <laughs> you just think you do. Amen, I believe this, but I don't believe that the way the Baptists believe it. And I don't believe this the way the Church of God believes it. Amen. I believe it the way my mind tells me and my heart and my soul teaches me. The convictions I come to. But he taught me a lot of things. That opened up my mind to a lot of things that's going on in the church. But there are many things that he says I do not agree with. But I still respect him. Can you come to the point? Because when I first got saved, I came under the influence of a lot of preachers that got up and said, they'd get up in the pulpit and they'd, and they'd start saying, I'll tell you right now, I preach the same thing I did 35 or 40 years ago and I haven't changed in a thing. And I'll look and say to myself, you ain't learned anything either. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's right. You haven't learned a thing. <laughs> I listen to myself say stuff I said 40 years ago. I say, oh, Lord. I say that. <laughs> but I said it in ignorance. God wouldn't let me get away with it now. That's the ministry. You, it's, you feel your way through it. You pray your you, way through it. You ask for guidance. You ask for the Holy Ghost to give you wisdom. And since then, God's given me uh, Randy uh, uh, Henry Henry R. Pike. How many of you know who I'm talking about? Amen. He's got a book this thick. Yeah. It's a uh, Harmony of the Gospels. I go in there and I'll start digging stuff out of that book. Outstanding work. A lot of work went into that, and I'll find myself agreeing with him time and time and time and time and time again. But there are places I do not agree with Brother Pike, and I love him and I respect him. When's the last time you had a preacher be that honest with you? I don't belong to anybody's clique. That's the real world I'm talking about tonight. The real world. The real world. The real world. But I have the greatest love and respect for that brother because he put years on the mission field. South Africa, Australia. That's tremendous. I'd recommend his book in a heartbeat. Great work. Great work. But if you ever start learning enough yourself and being established and rooted and grounded in your faith, you will find times that you don't necessarily agree with everything someone says, but you can still love them and respect them and be their brother and fellowship in the Lord. Why can't we do that? Father, in thy name we pray. Bless your holy word tonight. Bless it as it goes forth. Bless those that have heard it. Use it for the glory of God. In Jesus' sweet holy name I pray, and for Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. All right, stand up tonight.